Welcome back. This is Sean Wildermuth. Just got back from doing a couple of conferences, one in Alabama, one here in Atlanta. I got to talk to some really interesting people, open my eyes about some things. You're going to see more C-sharp content coming up to the fore, not just because .NET 8 is coming out, but because I have some things I've been really thinking about after talking with a bunch of different people. These videos don't have a sponsor. But if you want to support the kinds of things I do, go over to Pluralsight. I have a number of courses over there, including a brand new one on building an app with .NET 8, using Tailwind, Entity Framework, and finally Vue for the front end. You can see a link to it at the bottom of the screen. So in today's video, I want to talk about .NET 8 and ahead of time compilation or AOT compilation. In .NET 8, it extends the facility for natively compiling your .NET applications with ahead-of-time compilation. And to facilitate some of those, for especially for ASP.NET projects, this helps to make your applications as small as possible, especially when you're doing native AOT compilation. Now, if you're not doing AOT, you won't see as much benefit from these, but I'll show you how it works and why you might want to do it in some very particular cases. Let's take a look. So I'm starting out here just in a directory. You can see this will be at GitHub at Sean Wildermuth slash coding shorts slash net eight startup AOT, just like you see on the screen here. And all we're going to do is create a new. And so how I'm going to start is just by creating a new web project with the name of new start eight. And I'm going to tell it to just output it to our current directory instead of creating a new one means less nesting when I actually push this to source control. And so this project is pretty simple in that in our program, we just have what you've all seen before. Web application create a builder, and then inside of here, you might use the builder dot services to something like add transient and have some dependency in there, right? Obviously, we'll comment that out for a minute. It builds it, and then you can start to do things like calling map get and those sorts of things. And this works fine for really straight ahead web applications. And when we publish this app, and so let's just open this up a little and just say .NET publish. And I'm just going to point it at the CS proj. And it's going to go ahead and build. I'm still using the preview version. And if we look at what was generated for us in release, you can see this is all the files that are required. Now, a lot of these, like the app settings uh, and the depths JSON and the runtime config and even the web config, which is there so you can host it on IIS, though we won't, is pretty standard. And even the sizes of these, if we look at this in the, if we look at this in Windows Explorer, you'll see that the sizes of these aren't huge, though the EXE is a little large, though that has a lot of the startup code in it. This net start DLL is actually the start of it. Pretty small, and that's fine. So let's open up that CS proj, and I'm gonna add a piece in here that just says publish AOT. Pretty simple. And what this is gonna do is gonna use ahead of time compilation, so that when we wanna do a publish, and you can see here it's generating native code. And this takes a little longer because it actually requires the C++ tooling because it's taking our code, our MSIL, and converting it into native code for us. By default, this will be running on Windows that so you can point it at the different kinds of files that you want to be generating native code for. When you do this, it isn't portable. It is for the particular architecture you're using. Now just navigate over to our publish directory for release. Instead of a publish directory, there's now a WinX64, which is what it picked by default because I'm running on Windows. And this has all those same files that it needed, but it brought these in here because what it was actually gonna do is in this nested one, it has compiled it into a single executable that one ran is going to not need any dependencies except any file dependencies you have. This PDB is just so you can get debug information and that's where the bulk of the size of this. 
So this contains your application plus anything that the framework needs. And so if we run this, not a big surprise, it's running the same application, but you can see it started up incredibly quickly because there's no interpreting the files and converting them into machine code. None of that happens until so you have a really quick startup. But this size might be an issue. And let's remember that's about 13 megs. And let's change this startup to create Slim Builder. It's going to create a smaller version of the builder that you need with less services automatically wired up. But a lot of the ones you're probably already using, ones that it doesn't support or well-documented, are ones that you're likely not going to be using. Some of the examples of this is like hosting in IIS isn't supported out of the box. You can add the support. But the reason for taking these services out wasn't just to make the web application itself smaller, was to take out any of the features that needed reflection. And this is an important idea around ahead of time compilation. In most cases, a lot of the code that you saw in earlier versions of .NET relied on reflection to do some magic sort of things. The reason why reflection is an issue here is that reflection has dynamic code and it makes it harder for the AOT compiler to do its job. It means it's harder to trim that code when it's trying to create these very small executables. And so the answer to reflection, which a lot of us have been told is slow over the years anyway, is the idea of source generators. And these are and these are components that will actually build code at development time as well as at compile time. And this is the likely replacement for reflection in a lot of cases. And that's why the Create Slim Builder eliminates anything that still requires reflection. A lot of these things that are reflection-based are for parts of the system that people weren't necessarily using. If you need the functionality that the Create Builder has, you can still use that, though the AOT compiling won't be quite as good. Or you can have the Create Slim Builder and then opt into a, some of those, which then you're only going to be using those AOT deficient assemblies on purpose, like you're opting into it and knowing what the rigors are. But it's important to know in .NET, larger assemblies and a large batch of assemblies is easier for .NET to handle. It's been tuned to handle these. The only time when you really get a big win is if you're using that ahead of time compilation. So let's see what happens when we create this Slim Builder. And let's go ahead and publish it again. You can see it's now down to nine megs. Substantial if you have a pretty empty application, but the the changes here may not be huge, but it does mean that it doesn't need to handle, but it does mean you know it's going to be as small as possible. Now, there is another option. Let's change this to Empty Builder. Now, Empty Builder doesn't allow you to just pass in the R. You have to actually pass in a new web application options, which we can just put as new there because it'll infer it. And we might want to set things in there, but for now, let's just leave it at new and let's attempt to run this. So .NET run, immediately you're going to start to see there's no service of type I server. Have you ever dealt with that before? And this sort of implies something. Empty builder is empty builder. You're going to need to opt into any services that you need. This is not just dependency injection services. So for us, we're going to need to say builder web host, because there isn't a web host set up, let's use Kestrel core. So we're just going to use the bare minimum of what Kestrel, the web server inside of .NET core supports. And so let's save that and let's run it again. .NET run. Still unable to find required services. Add routing is missing. Oh, okay. Let's builder.services.add routing. Might be able to get away with routing core, but let's leave it at routing for a minute. And let's run it one more time. And did it actually start, right? That's the big question here. Because we're not getting anything out of here after the obviously building part, right? And the reason we're not is there's no logging installed. So all the log messages are just disappearing into the ether. There's no reading of the application settings even right? Because we'd never opted into that. So Create Empty Builder has a use case for really specific needs where you want to control every aspect of this. 
I think about half a percent of all ASP.NET projects would benefit from creating Empty Builder. Don't do this unless you really are like, I don't want to do anything. Like, you might be implementing something that isn't really a web server where you want to really efficiently return some amount of data, right? And so you could go down to the core and just use app run to do something really fast. So context.response.write async hello world, right? I'm not going to get any formatting or anything like that. Let's go ahead and wait that. But then we can have an application that actually does that. And let's see if it works by making sure that we pass in, because we can't read the configuration, we're going to tell it what URI to start listening for. So .NET run again. Again, no response because we're not opting into any logging. But if we go to the page, there we get our hello world. In fact, because we don't care what's in this, we're always going to get hello world. There is no routing. We're just saying every time someone comes to this, return hello world. So you could see that in very minute cases that using the create empty builder might actually be useful. But don't go crazy. You do not have to have control over everything that you opt into. Some of it gets lost in the wash of performance. If you're doing any sort of real data handling, the fact that there's two or three fewer services inside of the dependency injection, you'll never notice. Because most of those things are created as needed anyway. And so just to complete the round trip here, let's go ahead and say .NET Publish again. When we look over here, we can see it's marginally smaller. Because from the slim to this version where it's blank, it's doing trimming of anything we're not using anyway. So the benefit you're getting here is going to be small. What is it? One meg, one and a half meg at, at max? You're just not going to see a big difference here. So I hope you've looked at the way I've done this and seen these new startup experiences of the Create Empty Builder, the Create Slim Builder, as well as, of course, the default Create Builder that we've had the whole time. While these new ways of creating a builder are important, they're probably not going to affect you much unless you're building ahead-of-time compilation targets. I'm obliged to say, because this is YouTube after all, if you've gotten this far, please like, subscribe, that all helps. If you have any questions about this or want to know where to get the code, look down in the description right past the like button. Go ahead and comment, and I try to answer those pretty quickly. See you next time on Coding Shorts. Coding Shorts.